Well, Philip and I were teaching together at the University of Technology, Sydney, um, and we, one of the research projects we were doing was to do with uh, public buildings. And we thought or we discovered that uh, the public buildings and public spaces of the city hadn't really been studied from an architectural point of view at any university before. So it had, we um, conducted a class where our students went out into the field and looked at the public buildings and then also into the libraries and archives and studied the original source material, the original drawings, discussions about the buildings and so forth. So from that class at the university, that's what brought this project into being. At the beginning, we didn't intend to make a book. We intended to increase uh, our level of understanding and our students' level of understanding and interest in the subject. Well, we first um, set that assignment in about 2001, but it really built on other assignments that we'd set students and other design projects that we'd taught on the theme of the public building and public space. And so we actively pursued that with students at UTS till 2006, and then again with students at University of New South Wales in 2009. And then really on the promptings of the then government architect, Peter Mould, who said, you really have to bring all this unseen material into the public domain publish it as a book and on really his uh, push we then started to produce the book and then we all we immediately found that the student drawings while they were great they needed to be supplemented they needed to be put into an overall survey of the city um, there were a lot of buildings they'd simply never got to because our teaching had, had finished and so we kept filling in the gaps a bit obsessively like a, a collector you know trying to get every piece of the puzzle and then while we were doing this our colleagues, other architects, landscape architects and so forth, we contacted them to see what they knew and many of them contributed original drawings of recent projects that we were able to also include in the book. So altogether there would have been maybe a hundred students or so and then maybe up to 50 or so of our colleagues as well. Mm. So, and then particularly in Philip's office, many of his staff redrew many of the drawings and in my studio, some of my staff also remade parts of drawings and so forth. So it's truly a collaborative effort of hundreds of people. Well, I like all of them, really, so I don't have a particular favourite. But I think most Sydney siders, and in fact most people in the world, would recognise Sydney Cove with the circular key, the bridge and the opera house forming this um, beautiful place and um, I think that by default many people would have as their favourite place. It's where we celebrate New Year's Eve, it's where um, the British first arrived, it's where before that the Aboriginal people had huge shell middens indicating both where they farmed the oysters and ate and enjoyed the harbour. It's um, where many of our great events have been. And it is also a concentration of lots of public places and buildings. Customs House, the Overseas Passenger Terminal, the Museum of Contemporary Art, um, many, many places of public and society significance are located around Sydney Cove. You can also think of the great street. So we're looking out on Bridge Street, which is Australia's first street, Macquarie Street, much later, the cut through of Martin Place, which is this incredible stone room. Um, the great parks, we you know, don't really think that we actually have some of the best urban parks in the world of any city. So you think of not only the Botanic Gardens, of course, its relation to the harbour, but Hyde Park is an absolute classic of its type as a, as a mature, substantial urban park bounded by streets, an urban living room for the city. So you, know, you can then contrast that with um, the jewel-like Macquarie Place. So there's actually a, a richness of spaces that sometimes people don't, don't fully appreciate in Sydney. So if you think of the Sydney Opera House on one headland and the Harbour Bridge on the other hand, on the one hand, the House of Culture, what the great work of architecture of the 20th century, Jorn Utzon's masterpiece, not only the building and its magnificent interiors, but its relationship to the greater site of the harbour and its specific creation of the forecourt and the promenades around it. 
On the western headland of Sydney Cove, you have this monumental bridge, the greatest arch bridge built in the world at that time with its pylons, which uh, actually recall uh, the war memorials of, of the First World War there. Yeah, the design is quite explicit reference to that. And so you have the great work of engineering talking to the great place of culture. Two buildings built in the middle decades of the 20th century, two works of profound optimism and skill and daring that actually should give all of us uh, a great sort of uh, resolve about how we can make a better Sydney. They're, they're, they're buildings which are celebrated not only in Sydney, maybe we take them a bit for granted, but they're rightly celebrated around the world. They're the image of urban Australia, but they're the reality also of our everyday life. I think you can't be completely pessimistic in a city that has two such fabulous works built in recent times, and they should really set a standard for us in thinking about our city and what's possible and what we should do. There's also something about their scale which I think is really important. Now, I've stood on the platform at Wentworth, um, Wentworth Falls Station in the Blue Mountains and I've been in the middle of the bush, south of the city in the Great, the great National Park and I've, been, I've landed flying in from the north and from the south and from the east in an aeroplane. And at each of these places, you can see clearly in the sunlight the Opera House and the Harbour Bridge. So the full extent of the metropolis is actually physically aware of these places. And that's quite an extraordinary thing, actually, that they can be um, so central physically in the city. It's quite a wonderful thing that you catch glimpses of them throughout our city. It's, it's, it's really quite surprising. Um, well, it's very hard to confine them to five, but, but different spaces have different qualities. So whether it's the Anzac Memorial and the Pool of Remembrance, whether uh, you know, it's the sublime recent works at, at the Mint, which is the, the home for the Historic Houses Trust, um, the, the, whether it's the first house here or the Greenway grouping at Queen Square, which is incredibly powerful 200 years after it was laid out by Greenway. There are so many fantastic pieces in the city, but. Perhaps my personal favourite, or in amongst many, maybe my favourite today, is the Lands Department building just nearby on Bridge Street. Because in many ways, Bridge Street, you must remember, is the first street created in urban Australia. It was the street that led up to the Governor's house, to the gates of the house. And Governor Philip laid out a series of houses for uh, uh, dignitaries along the street. What is our vision? over Sydney into the future and how can Bridge Street and its wonderful buildings along this street play a role or speak to such a rich tradition that goes back to 1788? How can they speak in an optimistic, forward-looking way about positive change, public interest, uh, informed government? And, Brid and the Lands Department, people may not know, it's full of the most wonderful rooms. Mm. So at its very centre, it has this cubic room, several stories high, three or four stories high. With a lantern, with circular a lantern, lantern on the top, which was where all the maps of all the titles of land in New South Wales were stored. It's like a vault. But that room could be changed in so many ways to be a fantastic scientific theatre, for example, or a great place of display, or a place of, of gathering of many different types. And it also has at its top, at the front, a dome that rotates that contained a telescope. It was an observatory. And you can just imagine the reinterpretation of that room as a public place. That would be an extraordinary thing. But it was also the quintessential modern office building. So it was the most environmentally and structurally progressive building in the city when it was built. It was built of high quality sandstone. It's built on a sloping site. It masterfully uh, manages the, the slope and the terrain. It makes beautiful uh, st street facades on all sides. It relates um, perfectly to Macquarie Place, directly opposite. It's sublimely skillful in so many ways. And in fact, that's been one of the joys of the book, is actually to discover these places anew that we all knew, we'd all been to the Lands Department, but to actually see uh, its extreme skill and optimism, to understand the story of its making, of its foundation. Uh, not just that building, but so many of the buildings. You see real purpose, real ambition, right through the history of the city. And that's something we need to recapture and understand fully if we're to build purposely today. Well, I 
think they do value it. So, um, and you know they value it because look at how many people come to concerts in the domain or to New Year's Eve or to performance at the Opera House or a protest against war in Martin Place or the celebration that, uh, of the victory of war in Hyde Park and Martin Place or to enjoy Hyde Park on the weekend. Or when the bridge is closed um, to traffic and it can actually be a place you promenade over. I think there's so many myriad examples. Uh, the festivals recently in Sydney uh, have been quite remarkable. Um, we've highlighted a number in the book, but you could have uh, referred to Tropfest the other night that had at least 90,000 people in the domain. And of course, that's, that's a festival which has always grown from being in the streets and public spaces of the city. And the Festival of Sydney and Vivid and the Film Festival, when these are on, the city is full of people. During the Olympics, the city was just absolutely packed with people everywhere. And so um, my observation is that people love the city, they appreciate it. Parallel with that, I think there's also those who, um, maybe others who don't really see how much appreciation is given to the city and maybe they need to be more aware of this appreciation that's given in just everyday life, really. I hope people will look at our book and they'll see the drawings and read the text and look at the illustrations and they'll be inspired to think other things about the city and other things about public Sydney. So really, I think our hope is that people will make of this book all sorts of different things. They will think differently about the city, they will gain a greater knowledge of it, but they'll be inspired to think in different ways. They'll be inspired to think what a great city this is, what a great group of public buildings and public spaces we have, and also inspired to think that in the future we can keep adding to this, and that um, the city will be increasingly a great place. It's easy in, in most periods to be pessimistic about things that are going on, that you see change wholly in the negative. But the book, um, as the Lord Mayor talks about in her afterwards, is really the things that Sydney has got right. And I think there's genuine cause for optimism. But also what, perhaps one of the ways you can gauge contemporary interventions is how do they actually stack up against other initiatives which have been implemented and which as, you know, have so much made Sydney the better city that it is today. And so I think there's the sort of a cautionary tale in amongst what is primarily an optimistic view of the making of the city. I mean, reading the book and looking at it, you can look back on a history of projects, of interventions, of changes, of things being destroyed and rebuilt, of things being modified and changed. And looking at, back at that, it should take away the fear of the new in the future. Because at every stage in our history, we have made the city anew and afresh. And generally speaking, those changes have been good changes. They've been optimistic about the future. They've been positive. They've added to our public space. And so that's how I would see our future as being optimistic about the new. I think that's what you learn about the past.